seems to me that uh, we have a uh, holiday this week. Do we? I won't seem real sure. Friday. What's Friday? <laughs> Valentine's Day. I know that it's not a Christian holiday. But I think it is a good thing that we are reminded at least once a year that we really need to love. The theme for my messages all year round for the whole year are the theme is exalting Jesus, lifting up Jesus, lifting up Jesus. And back during the month of January, we looked at miracles that Jesus did in the lives of people as we looked at scripture, things that Jesus did to help people out that Jesus really needs to be praised. Um, just one quick example. I preached about people being delivered from the demons and many times holding them captive. And I do believe that there are literal demons. We looked at the gathering demoniac and this was a man that was infested with demons, um, called himself legion, which means that he may have had as many as 6,000 demons in him. And it, it was one of those things that the demons controlled his life. He was not able to function normally. And as a pastor, I'm often made aware that even within our churches, people can be troubled by the demons of their past. Things that have gone on within their lives that it's hard for them to break free of. And I just have a good news for you, according to the word of God. Jesus can set you free. Jesus can give you new life. It says that the man that had the demons cast out of him, the people from the town came and they found him seated, clothed, and in his right mind because Jesus had given him the ability to function again. Many times within our churches there are people that could testify to Jesus having set them free from the demons of the past. Could be the demons of alcohol, feeling like, oh, I've got to have alcohol or drugs. Could be gambling. It could be somebody that loves to spend money. You know, there's all sorts of vices that people can have that Satan can get a stronghold within our lives. And I just want to say to you, we can lift up Jesus by giving praise to him for the things that he's delivered us from. So that was the messages in January. As we moved into February, I told you we're going to be speaking about lifting up Jesus through love. Last Sunday, I told you the most important thing that we need to do with regard to lifting up Jesus and loving is loving God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. Sadly, many of us may not love God the way that we should. I used as an illustration last Sunday, I didn't ask him before the service, I did talk with him after the service, find out whether or not I embarrassed him or hurt his feelings, he said absolutely not. I used him here. Why did I use Tim? Because how many years ago were you married? Uh, 30 some. 30? 30 some years? Yeah. He married her 30 years ago, and um, when she had this, this stroke, this massive brain bleed, and went into the coma, Tim, who's a nurse by profession, said, I don't want her kept at the hospital. Nothing against the nursing profession at the hospital. But he ended up saying many times they're overworked at the hospital. And he says, I want to be able to care for my need, the needs of my wife, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So he had her brought home. And he has been by his wife's side for the past 18 weeks. I know I'm not saying this to praise him. I'm just using this example of how we should love. And I made the comment to him after I said, Tim, I hope I didn't make you feel uncomfortable. He says, no, Pastor, you didn't make me feel uncomfortable at all because he says, I love my wife with all of my heart. He said unapologetically, she is the best thing that ever happened to me. And I use him as an illustration because, folks, that's the sort of relationship that lifts up God. When we love God with all of our heart, you know, maybe this is a poor illustration to use. I don't know. You be the judge. 
But when I wake up on Sunday morning, God has seen me through another week. Don't try to hold me in bed and tell me, don't go to church to thank my Heavenly Father for what He's done for you this past week. Amen. It's a testimony to my love for the one who's given me the gift of life. There's, there's lots of areas within our lives that we could show more love to the one who made us. You know, you, you can look in your own life and ask yourself the question, are there things that I can do? Are there things that I can do to show my love for God? I am um, having my coat pocket up here. This is, these are often the two things that I hold up whenever I get to talking about love. Love of God. What are these? What is it? Checkbook and a date book or no? Yeah, a date book. This is my pocket planner. Which represents my time. This is my checkbook, which represents my money. And if I go looking through these and I don't see that God has gotten any of my time, that God has not gotten any of what He's given me. I can tell you folks all I want to with my mouth that I love God. Those two things say volumes about whether or not I love God. I use as an illustration, and this will kind of lead into the message for today. I'm not married. All of y'all know that except for our new newcomers today. Never been married. Maybe someday. But I've been told, I can't tell this from experience, but I have been told it's not a very good idea to go courting a young lady and fail to give her any time or fail to give her any money. <laughs> I've been told I could tell her all that I want to that I love her. But if I don't want to spend any money on her and I don't want to spend any time with her, they tell me I'm not going to get very far in that relationship. Do I hear an amen? Amen. I figured it would be at least three times that long. Amen. So I kind of throw that out to you. It's kind of a reminder for what last Sunday's message was. Love God. Look at what you're doing. Do you really love God? Okay. I, I'll use one other thing with regard to money. Jesus took the disciples. And by the way, I don't preach about money. The Lord has provided my needs. Okay? But I only use this as an illustration. <coughs> Jesus took his disciples one day at Jerusalem when they were sitting at the temple and they were watching the people as they went to give their offerings. Some of them brought rather large gifts. And did you just call the attention of the disciples to a little woman? <coughs> probably shabbily dressed. She quietly walked over to the offering box and threw in two small copper coins. And Jesus said, did you see that little lady there? It's not a gift. Yeah, we'll saw her. What of it? Jesus says, you realize that woman just put more in than anybody else that came today? The disciples, huh? Some people gave a lot more. Jesus says, oh no. Those people ended up giving what they had left over. That woman gave everything that she had. And I only end up using that as an illustration, not about the money. But my prayer, folks, is that we might grow in our giving, not so much financially, but giving everything that we have to Jesus Christ. I'll close by saying this before I get to the message for today. You do realize that you don't own anything. You do realize that. You don't own a house. You don't own a car. You don't own jewelry. You say, well, yes I do. Fifty years from now, you still own it. 
60 years from now, you still own it. 70 years from now, you still own it. No, you're just merely taking care of it until God calls you home. The Bible talks about we are stewards. That we're supposed to take what we have and use it the way that he wants it used. Even as I say that, I'm reminded I've got some work to do. And so anyhow, with today's message, loving God was the first week's message. The second week's message is about loving our families. I'm going to have you turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We can lift up Jesus by the way we love within our families. People can come to Jesus because of the way that we demonstrate love within our families. Primarily, marriage relationships, but as I get ready to preach every Sunday morning, I'm reminded we got a lot of older folks here that aren't married. So I have to broaden the message to include not just couples, but the sort of love relationships that we have within our homes. It's the sort of relationship that we have within our families. The sort of a relationship, love relationship, that lifts up God. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22. Um, I'm going to end up reading down through verse 30. 22 through 30. This is what the Apostle Paul says to the Christians at Ephesus. Wives, submit to your husbands as the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. And I know that this passage of scripture is just talking about husbands and wives, but I hope and pray that I'll be able to take that and broaden it. And I think that it's appropriate to broaden the application of it here to more than just husbands and wives, because if it's only good for husbands and wives, I don't know about you, but it doesn't do me any good. Make sense? Um, I had an opportunity two years ago to go with my younger brother to his church over in Harrisburg. And in the Sunday school class, they kind of pointed out something about this passage of scripture. I'll kind of throw it in here. Um, it talks about that what the husband needed from the wife was, it uses the word submit. Can I use a different word? What the husband needs for from the wife, they, they, this was in a Sunday school class and they were doing a whole session on it. And it's still stuck in my head two years later. Okay? Use a different word rather than submit. It means respect. Now I'm going to paint those guys in a bad light, maybe. I don't know if they'll take it as that. Our guys are known for having egos. Hey, I'm just asking a question. Are we known for having egos? We, 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 we really do. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to deny it. We don't like to be questioned. And the Apostle Paul, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, ends up saying, hey, look, one of the things that you can really do to help strengthen your marriage, you show some respect. Now, in our society today, one of the things that's most oftentimes done is the guys are made to look like the buffoon. <laughs> no respects us anymore. We're all riding danger fields. I mean, am I right, guys? There's a sense of pride about us. And oftentimes, if the woman really wants to strengthen a relationship, show more respect. Now, I'll also say that 
it's what it starts with, okay? I didn't choose to deal with the men first, also Paul did. Then he says, but there's the wives too, the wives have needs. It says what the wife needs is love. The Sunday school class that I went to, and by the way, you say, well, what does it mean, love? When many times thrive on affection. It's not intended in any way, shape, form to be sexual, but they really enjoy being thought about. Love. In fact, um, I'm reminded, been over 25 years ago, that I was engaged. I was given a couple books to read, uh, there were several books on marriage. One of the books that I ended up reading was, I can't remember which of the two books it was. One was Letters to Karen, the other one was Letters to Philip. Written by Charlie Shedd. Charlie Shedd was a counselor, a pastor, and served for years and years and years. And in one of the two books, in writing to his children, by the way, these books were some advice for his kids before they got married. And he ended up saying to, it was either his son or his daughter, he says, let me tell you about a woman. He said, now this woman was really married to a deadhead. The guy was just an absolute loser. He could not end up keeping a job to save his life. He was just forever bungling things up and making a mess for the family to have to deal with. And she was an attractive woman. And a lot of people ended up saying, how in the world does this woman manage to still hang on to him? Why would she even want to hang on to him? And then he writes to his son and daughter, says, well, one of the things that he did, he just constantly showed his wife how much he loved her. And some of the things that he did, he said, for instance, one day he drove out to the country and picked her a handful of wildflowers and brought it back to her. He just showed this woman he loved. One day he was in by the dime store and he knew that she liked working jigsaw puzzles, so he reached in his pocket, pulled out 59 cents. This was back when puzzles were really cheap. Bought her a 59 cent jigsaw puzzle. And this woman, when she got around other people, that's all that she could talk about was how much this guy loved her. He loved her, not so much by what he said, but by what he did. And it made all the difference in the world. Charlie Shedd was of the impression that this guy could go ahead the rest of his life, making a mess of his life. And this woman would still be deeply in love with him. And this is what the Apostle Paul says. Listen, women thrive on it. Men respect. As they get more respect, guys show more love. As they show more love, show more respect. And the Sunday school class said, it's a cyclical thing. I know that my time this morning is short. So I'm going to have to alter my message a little bit. This is in a very real way. The way that God the way that God has worked in my life I'm not going to go into any details and it's not like I want you to think that I'm some heinous person up here. But I found that what I've needed in my life was to grow in my respect for God. Grow in my respect for what His Word says. I know the Apostle Paul has talked about husbands and wives, but I'm trying to bridge this over to my relationship with God. Sure, I was saved at age seven or eight. I was very active in the church growing up. Felt called into the ministry, I guess, when I was roughly a sophomore or junior in college. Committed myself to four missions. Never really thought that I would end up being a pastor. I know people say, well, you've always been 
kind of in church and trying to do what God wanted you to do. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to tell you as a pastor, now looking back over my life, that as I start to give God more respect of taking his word and end up saying, Lord, I'll give you a brief synopsis of what I was talking about with the Sunday school class this morning. The biggest problem that we have within the church today is that we don't follow closely enough what the Word of God says about what's right and what's wrong. We have ended up, what I told the Sunday school class this morning, buying into the thought of what took place in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, they were tempted to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. When they eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what's going to happen to them? We're going to become like God. What does that mean? That we get to make the decisions about what's right and wrong. And I have found that within my life, even though I've been in the ministry now for 35 years, I went off to seminary when I, back in 1984, that I find that over the course of the past 35 years, as I start to study the Word of God more and just accept what God has revealed in His Word, rather than thinking of some way that I can get around it, as I respect God more, I experience more of God's love within my heart. I love God more for what he has revealed to me. I will kind of throw this in here. One of the years that give you a glimpse in my personal life. One of the things that I have learned probably the most, even within the past couple of years, is to love God with all of my mind. Oh, I've still got a lot of work to do, but I'm just telling you, the more that I allow the Word of God to speak to me with regard to what goes on in my mind, the more I love God. Because I find that the Word of God was right all along. Y'all end up saying, what sort of things go on in your mind? Well, I'm not going to give you details. But I will tell you this much. It's probably not that much different than the sort of things that go on in your mind. My mind is what controls my body. And when my mind is not focused on the things of the Lord, my body is not controlled. as simple as that. And I just want to say to you that as I begin to respect the Word of God more and say, Lord, open my eyes when I sit down to read your Word that you'll end up speaking my heart. I'll add this. We just finished here about a month ago on Sunday nights a study from Mark chapter 7 in which Jesus talks about the sins that come from a person's heart. And I can't speak for the rest of the church, but I know that as I went down through that list of things that go on within the heart, I had to put a check mark just about by every single one of them. I said, that's me, that's me, that's me. And Jesus starts saying to me from Mark chapter 7, do you realize the problems that those things are causing you within your life? Not because you are doing them right now, but because you are thinking them. What you think is what you eventually do. Every time. Jesus has been convicting me and saying, listen, until you start working on what goes on in your mind, you're never going to change what goes on in your body. So folks, I've been working on that list. You know what the very first thing was on that list? It doesn't give a lot of details, but it said the very first thing on that list was evil thoughts. Evil thoughts 
cover a lot of things. Evil thoughts, it doesn't just mean, you know, something that's really bad. It means, how could I get that person back for what they did to me? And God ends up saying, why do you want to do that? You realize all that's going to do is cause you more problems? One of Turtle's favorite sayings that he's rubbed my face in more times than not. When I picked on him, I do pick on him. He ends up wagging his finger at me, and he can't get back at me, and he just says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Jesus starts off that list with sin so hard. He says, Some of you folks are struggling with evil thoughts about how in the world you're going to get back at somebody that's ended up doing something to you. Jesus says, let it go. God's already got it taken care of. If something needs to be paid back, the Father's already got a plan, so you don't have to busy, busy yourself trying to figure one out. I'm just telling you, folks, as I go through that thing in Mark chapter 7, I keep saying, Lord, teach me. My respect for Jesus grows and my love for you grows. Of what he's doing. I'm going to close the message this morning by asking you about your love relationship, especially with your family. Is it the sort of love relationship that Jesus is lifted up on? Guys, if you are blessed to have a wife, are you showing her love? Jesus gave himself for the church. And he said, guys, that's the way you should love that wife. You should be willing to do anything to help that wife out. Show her love. And guys, I will tell you this. If you love your wife, she will show you more respect. Women, are you showing your husband the respect that he needs? And again, I don't know that I've done a very good job of it, but we can bridge that over to our other relationships, especially our relationship with God. As we begin to respect God as the one that knows what we should do, and we just do it. Our love for him will grow. And we will be better witnesses for him. I'm going to ask, would you pray with me, please? Father, I don't know how well I did today with the message about Valentine's Day. But my prayer, Father, is that we might have gained something from being in your house this morning that will cause us not only to love and respect people more, but more importantly, that we might love and respect you more. Father, my heart's desire is that we might bring people to your son, Jesus Christ. That as people end up seeing Jesus in us, they might want to know what made the difference. Pray, Father, that we might lift up Jesus at every opportunity because Jesus said in John chapter 12, if I be lifted up, I will draw people to myself. I pray, Father, that you'll continue to work in our hearts and our lives, that you might teach us your ways and that we might be used by you, that people might come to know your son. Father, I just ask as we have a time of invitation that if there are decisions that we need to make, whether it's recommitment to join the church or get saved, Father, you would use this time to help us make those decisions. For Jesus' sake, in his name we pray. Amen. If you have a need, now is the time to come. Turn to page 645 and please stand.